Here are my disclosures. Uh, none are relevant uh, to this talk and course. So as we begin, we'll have an overview. Uh, we'll have an introduction regarding rehabilitation. We'll discuss gait, the normal aspects of gait and also abnormal aspects of gait. Uh, we will have a discussion on amputations. We'll talk about prosthetics, a little bit on spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury, and then we will finish up with some questions to review what we've discussed. So as we begin our rehabilitation discussion, <coughs> this quote is quite good from uh, the most recent uh, JBJS, uh, What's New in Orthopedic Rehabilitation, discussing uh, that orthopedic rehabilitation approaches the patient in a holistic fashion and considers the surgical episode as an important yet small facet in these patients' management and total recovery. Although traumatologists and orthopedic rehabilitation specialists, specialists focus their practice on functional restoration following traumatic brain injury, stroke, trauma, and other musculoskeletal impairments, all orthopedists recognize the value of rehabilitation in determining the success or failure of surgical interventions, and therefore the relevant aspect of this talk for this course. So let's talk a little bit about walking. This is a repetitive process of sequential lower limb motion that propels the body forward. It is an energy efficient process. <clears throat> it minimizes the excursion uh, of center of gravity and keeps the body upright. And involves a complex action of agonist and antagonist uh, of muscles uh, for performance. There are two main cycles of gait that are often tested. We have to understand that as we go from step to stride, that this takes us between the stance and swing phases, with 60% normally being in the stance phase and 40% often being in the swing phase. As we look at walking in gait, the double stance or support phase is the period when both feet are on the ground. And so walking and gait are essentially an alternation of stance, swing phase, with the residual double stance support phase in the middle. When we discuss running, uh, this represents the double stand support being lost, as often both feet are in the air during a period of running. <clears throat> and at this point in time, stance and swing ratio reverses in a two to third manner. Walking again being an energy efficient process, minimizes the excursion of the center of body mass, and is key to normal gait. A little bit on body and posture. The trunk center of gravity is located anterior to T10. And the body's line of gravity is anterior to S2. The torso, in majority of adults, represents 70% of the body weight during gait. A little bit on gait mechanics. This involves pelvic tilt and rotation, lateral trunk shift, knee flexion, as well as knee, foot, and ankle motion working in concert. These are working together to minimize the shift the center of body, the body center of gravity has in vertical and horizontal axes. And then we move to gait dynamics. The center of mass, again, being the body line of gravity is anterior to S2, as we mentioned previously. That center of mass <clears throat> then displaces vertically and laterally during gait. With weight transfer, the pelvis shifts to the weight-bearing side. Now, a little bit on pelvic tilt, as this is a basis of gait, and an understanding of this is necessary as we move forward throughout the rest of the talk. The swing leg drops five degrees below the opposite side during mid-stance. Now, factors that lead to abnormal gait. These can be pain, weakness, joint abnormalities, and this can, be inf this can influence stance and swing phase aspects of gait. To identify pathology or a source of abnormal gait, one must evaluate the stance and swing cycle and also un have an understanding of the muscle activity during a normal cycle. A little bit on muscle action. These are concepts often tested and we'll discuss them as well as a number of uh, means to remember them for the exam and going forward. So eccentric muscle action represents a muscle lengthening or elongation while it contracts. And this represents the most efficient aspect of muscle action, often being, more, uh, often being three to nine times more efficient than normal activity. If we remember the E in eccentric and elongation and most efficient, that's an easy way to remember this for the exam. Antagonist groups dampen the activity of the agonist. And then we work toward concentric muscle shortening. 
Concentric, representing contraction. Again, if you remember the C in concentric, it leads to contraction, and that is an easy way to remember it for the test. A little bit on muscle activity. As we talk about heel strike to foot flat, you have an initial contact phase. The tibialis anterior is working in an eccentric contraction to control plantar flexion. And then you have the foot flat position to heel rise, which is rep represents terminal stance. The tibialis posterior is working in a concentric contraction in combination with the triceps sura or Achilles complex for an eccentric contraction controlling dorsiflexion. And as we go from heel rise to toe off, the triceps sura or Achilles complex is propelling you forward in the propulsive plantar flexion force. So let's talk about this in a little more depth. This diagram represents <coughs> another description of the stance phase in the gait cycle in muscle activity, and very important for understanding. If we appreciate the small drawing of the little devil working on the back of the leg, as we go from heel strike to foot flat and heel off and toe off, he is going through a number of cycles of effort. During heel strike, he is working to bring the foot, forefoot down in a slow, gradual process into the foot flat stage. From there, he drops the rope, as you can see in the diagram, and then starts to focus on the heel off position and working hard to bring the heel off the ground, then going into the very aggressive and more propulsive, powerful push off position with a concentric contraction along the Achilles sura and triceps sura. Now, understanding some of those basic concepts we previously discussed, now we can talk about normal function, muscle function, and also the lower extremity as it relates to an extensive understanding of gait. As we look at this slide, we talk about a number of the <coughs> uh, muscles of the lower extremity. And as you can see in the action column, majority of these are eccentric contractions. Again, that makes sense in regards to our understanding of an eccentric contraction being the most efficient matter of muscle activity. It also makes sense that most muscles would want to function in the most efficient manner. So as we focus on this slide, we now will look at the gluteus medius and hip abductors, which control pelvic tilt, the quadriceps and hamstring, which work together to stabilize the knee at heel strike as well as knee extension during stance, and a little more on the tibialis anterior and gastrocnemius, which work together with ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion in their respective manners. Again, as we focus on the tibialis anterior and gastrocnemius, it is important to understand from this group of muscles that this is the one area of the lower extremity and of gait where there is a transition between concentric and eccentric activity, as previously described with our diagram with our little devil on the back of the leg. So let's focus in on each of these muscle groups. As we look at abductor function during gait, I look at the gluteus medius understanding that it is the median. It is the central aspect of gait in stabilizing the pelvis. The gluteus medius functions eccentrically to control pelvic tilt. And again, we discuss the fact that the normal pelvic tilt involves the swing leg dropping five degrees. The stance leg, or on the stance leg, the gluteus medius helps keep the le pelvis level. Now let's look closer to an abnormal gait associated with the gluteus medius, commonly discussed and examined, the Trendelenburg gait. The gluteus medius is deficient, and this leads to an increased pelvic tilt towards the uninjured side. With this increased pelvic tilt on the unaffected side during swing phase and also single leg stance, this leads to a compensation. The lurch or shift of the trunk towards the affected side during gait or single leg stance is done in order to level the body in response to the weak gluteus medius. A little bit on quadriceps muscle deficiency. So as we discussed previously, the quadriceps is, is involved in heel striking, knee extension, and stabilizing the knee. During stance, this dampens hamstring function and stabilizes the knee at heel strike. During the swing phase, knee extension is the focus, and this extends the knee. As we look at quadriceps muscle deficiency a little closer, the compensation for this is a lurch back or knee gait, sometimes called a quadriceps avoidance gait. As the individual cannot appropriately extend their knee to stabilize their gait pattern, the compensatory 
effort is to lurch back, to balance themselves. Again, trying to balance that center body of gravity moment with gait. A little bit on foot drop gait. With slap foot gait, patients increase knee flexion on the injured side to clear the floor. This involves the tibialis anterior working, again, concentrically and eccentrically, dorsiflexing the ankle at swing phase, but slowly plantar flexing the ankle and foot at heel strike. In the event an individual has a tibialis anterior injury, rupture, or nerve injury, a foot drop gait is a result as they can no longer control the slow plantar flexion moment of the tibialis anterior. When we look at flat foot or calcaneal gait, this is caused by an unopposed tibialis anterior function and leads to heel walking. The gastrocnemius, often in the stance phase, slows dorsif the dorsiflexion rate in stance, and therefore, individuals will walk on their heel or, again, a calcaneal gait. We often see this in some contractures uh, and also some pediatric uh, syndromic conditions. So, altalgic gait is essentially caused by pain, and the stance phase is often shortened, thus decreasing the joint forces on that injured side. And of course, this results in an alteration of the ratio of swing, stance, phase in that process. A little bit on crutches and canes, and we'll discuss this more into the talk. These decrease instability and pain, respectively. A crutch increases stability by providing additional loading joints, whereas a cane or canes shift the body center of gravity towards the affected side if used on the opposite hand. This results in a decreased joint loading on that side and also can help restore the swing stance phase ratio of gait. Now let's transition to amputations. Amputations are an important uh, aspect of any orthopedic surgeon's care. With adult amputations often being needed secondary to vascular disease, trauma, tumors, or infection, and often pediatric amputations being necessary due to congenital deformities or anomalies, trauma, and again, also for tumors. These are very critical concepts for any orthopedist. So the principles in pediatrics differ, however, from what we traditionally manage in the adult world. It is important to stabilize the proximal portion of the limb. In most cases, we recommend avoiding transosseous amputations, and any amputation is is important to preserve length when possible. And we must understand that the residual limb can grow over time, and this is very common in the pediatric population. Mechanical demand in the limb evolves, and this is something that we must take into account as we manage these patients. And there are also different psychological concerns in comparison to the adult population. So some important pearls for surgical planning and considerations in pediatric amputation. Disarticulation is recommended in a growing child. Overgrowth, as we mentioned previously, is most common in the long bones, being the humerus, fibula, tibia, and femur. And surgical revision and autogenous osteochondral stump capping is sometimes needed. Again, understanding that there is an evolution of the demand of the limb over time after a pediatric amputation. So as we hone in on, amputation, on the amputation discussion, some important reconstructive aspects should be discussed. Most amputations require a vascular supply. There are considerable metabolic considerations, and prosthetic fitting and planning are also critical. As amputations represent a reconstructive procedure, it should be considered an alternative to limb salvage when appropriate. This may and in many cases does require some psychological counseling to anticipate and provide the best platform for a good outcome, and often requires a multidisciplinary approach for the best outcome, involving orthotics, physical therapy, as well as, again, psychological counseling and support. A little bit of upper extremity amputations. Limb salvage is preferred in a limb that is sensate and that has grasping function. Again, for these amputations, you want to maintain as much length as possible. And the level of the amputation is often based on the level of vascular supply and soft tissue coverage. For transradial amputations and disarticulations, 
The optimal junction is the middle to distal third of the forearm. Retention of elbow of the elbow allows suspension of a prosthetic uh, device. This also preserves some lever arm capacity. And in this case, the soft tissue envelope allows for myodesis and can hide myoelectric prostheses uh, that are under development and currently being used. In regards to wrist disarticulations, these are cosmetically favored. This is secondary to the fact that they maintain the distal radial ulnar joint, and this preserves forearm rotation. The distal radius flare improves prosthetic suspension, which is also critical for function going forward. However, motor and battery for myoelectric components cannot be used in this case, and that is one downside to wrist disarticulations. Wound healing principles are essential to all amputations and then we'll transition to lower extremity amputations. So in the lower extremity, nutrition, immune status, and vascular supply are most critical due to the dependency of the lower extremity. Now with nutrition and immune status, we want to have an optimal environment for healing. The numbers that are often tested are serum albumin being greater than 3.5 grams per deciliter, an absolute lymphocyte count of greater than 15,000, you also must be aware of the negative acute phase reactant being decreased during the acute phase, which also can impact healing. And this is influenced by a number of factors, including capillary permeability, any medications patients may be on, their liver function, as well as renal function, as well as an inflammation. As we talk about vascular supply in more detail, it is important to understand that oxygenated blood supply is a prerequisite for its wound healing. A hemoglobin concentration of greater than 10 uh, grams per deciliter is what is preferred. And when looking at ischemic index, this is a measure of blood supply equal to the ratio of the Doppler pressure at the level being tested to the brachiosystolic pressure. An index greater than or equal to 0 0.5 is needed to support wound healing. And wound healing also depends on collateral flow. When we talk about vascular studies that are often used to determine the appropriateness for amputation and our opportunities for healing. The Doppler ultrasound is used uh, for arterial pressure uh, readings. And you want a pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury or higher. It's preferable. When we look closely at toe pressures, greater than 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury is preferred. As we look at transcutaneous partial pressure oxygen, or TCPO2, this is the gold standard for evaluating vascular flow. Greater than 40 millimeters of mercury is needed for acceptable healing, and less than 20 is often a predictor of poor healing, and additional interventions should be considered prior to pursuing an amputation in these groups. So a question reviewing some of the things we just discussed and concepts. A 77-year-old man with diabetes mellitus had a non-healing Wagner 1 ulcer under the medial sesamoid for the past three months. He smokes tobacco regularly. He has undergone several debridements and total contact casting. Examination reveals no palpable pulses. He has no erythema or purulence, and he is a febrile. Radar graphs reveal no abnormalities. What is the best initial diagnostic test to help determine why the ulcer has failed to heal? As we look at our options, we look at 5.07 on the sums weinstein monofilament test. A bone scan is an option. Thompson's test, a CT scan, or non-invasive vascular studies. Following up on the discussion we just had regarding the importance of blood flow for healing, the appropriate answer in this case is a diagnostic test evaluating uh, the vascular flow. And therefore, option number five, non-invasive vascular studies would be the best option for this question. So moving forward. Amputation alters metabolic cost involved in walking, altering the energy efficient process we discussed before and previously. This consumes energy and oxygen. It increases with the proximal level of the amputation, and it's inversely proportional to the length of the residual limb. Looking at the energy expenditure for ambulation, a general concept to remember that is highlighted here on the slide is that vascular amputations in majority of cases consume more energy than traumatic amputations. As we look at the amputation level to the left of the slide, 
in the first column, we can appreciate that long transtibial amputations actually consume the least amount of energy, as described here, with 10%. They also have the least amount of oxygen consumption, with the exception of obviously the last line here being wheelchair usage. And as the amputation moves more proximally, the amount of energy that is consumed is actually increased on both the percent energy as well as oxygen consumption levels. Often a bilateral transfemoral amputation secondary, secondary to vascular disease would have one of the highest energy as well as oxygen consumption cost. A little bit on weight bearing and amputations. Weight bearing and amputations through joints involves direct load transfer during gait. Terminal weight bearing is through the knee or an ankle disarticulation. Knee disarticulations are preferred in non-walkers and those who can support distal level wound healing. However, there are some special considerations that we must consider. You want to use a long posterior gastric nemius and padding. This is quite important. The patella tendon can be sutured to the cruciates and the notch. Muscle balance is critical as this provides an excellent platform for sitting and a lever arm for bed to chair transfers. Transfemoral amputations. These greatly increase metabolic cost of walking. It should be performed 12 centimeters of bone length when possible. Abduction and flexion deformities are common. And transfemoral amputees with vascular disease are less likely to walk well compared to others. And sometimes a disarticul disarticulation is appropriate if possible in select populations or those with significant comorbidities and again, also those who may be non-ambulatory prior to requiring this amputation. An adductor myodesis in the, in the position uh, for a procedure such as a transfemoral amputation is quite helpful and has been shown to affect outcome. This maintains the attachment to the linea aspera and tension by anchoring. It, prever it preserves femoral adduction for stance phase and also allows optimal prosthetic function. A little bit on Symes amputations. This is an ankle disarticulation. As we mentioned previously, these are sometimes preferred. They have advantages, limb length, partial weight bearing, it is the end stump that has to be covered with the heel pad, and it does have a lower energy cost than a below the knee amputation. There are disadvantages, however. Wound healing is a concern. Stump hypermobility can also represent problems or present itself with problems. Prosthesis fitting can be difficult in many cases, but these are well used uh, when you can use them for congenital deformity, such as a fibular hemimilia, proximal focal femoral deficiency, or congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia in the pediatric population. Success rate varies from 50 to 90 percent. Failures occur early due to wound healing, and this is often secondary to vascular insufficiency to the heel pad, as you must have a patent posterior tibial artery, which we will discuss further in a moment. As we appreciate the images to your right, showing a heel stump, Again, the posterior tibial artery must be intact to ensure good healing. This provides the main blood supply to the heel pad, and therefore, healing can be anticipated in the setting of a posterior tibial artery uh, functioning. And this also prevents heel migration. These often rarely require or rarely require prosthetic gait training, and therefore, that is one of the advantages of a sign amputation. A little bit on transtibial amputations, which is the workhorse and most commonly used amputation in orthopedics. The below the knee amputation is done at the musculotendinous junction of the gastrocnemius. We prefer to have 50% of the intact tibia remaining after the amputation, and 12 centimeters of bone length below the joint is preferred. A long posterior myocutaneous flap is helpful for healing as well as prosthetic fitting for patients as they move forward. A couple of aspects in discussion on amputee gait. This is a very important concept and often tested. So for amputees, as they ascend stairs, they should lead with their good leg. As they descend stairs, they should lead with their prosthetic leg. 
as we look closer at prosthetics, an AFO is often used, or ankle foot orthosis, is often used for a drop foot. Articulated AFOs allow for natural gait pattern, or for a natural gait pattern, uh, and also are fairly well tolerated. Now, a knee ankle foot orthosis is utilized for knee hyperextension or if individuals have a weak quadriceps. And this helps maintain, again, knee stability, understanding that, as we discussed previously, the quadriceps is critical to knee stability and knee extension. A little bit on prosthetic foot gait abnormalities. Again, a very often tested concept. As we look at prosthetic feet or prosthetic foot, a soft heel often results in knee extension. A hard heel often results in an overaggressive knee flexion. A plantar flex foot will also give you additional knee extension, and a dorsiflex foot gives an abnormality of a drop-off gait. Prosthetic feet in general, concepts to rec remember are that flexible, articulated, dynamic feet are very good as they provide ankle motion and often come with associated shock absorbers and rotators. These are useful for uneven terrain and high activity. Dynamic feet, which have a flexible keel, deform under load. The elastic keel is usually made of carbon fiber or polypropylene. A sack foot or sack feet gait abnormality and potentially overload of the opposite foot can occur with a foot prosthesis. Pistoning. The understanding of pistoning as it relates to prosthetic fitting is important. So pistoning within the prosthesis and the transtibial amputation can often occur. And if this occurs in the stance phase, it is often due to poor socket fit or volume change in the stump. If it occurs during swing phase, it is often an ineffect suspension system. So this is something I use to remember this concept that anything, any abnormality occurring in the swing phase is possibly or likely due to the suspension and vice versa. A suspension abnormality with a prosthesis will result in a swing phase gait abnormality. So alignment within a prosthesis is very important as well. So as we look into this, alignment within a prosthesis associated with gait abnormality is often tested. And this follows a residual stump malalignment. Alignment in regards to whether it is inset or outset is important to understand, as well as if it is more anterior or posterior than appropriate uh, for the amputation. And we'll discuss this in more detail now. So as we look at alignment and gait abnormalities, an outset below the knee prosthesis results in limb pressure in the distal medial and proximal lateral regions of the prosthetic. A compensatory gait that occurs from patients to compensate for this involves a circumduction gait. The soft tissue findings include ulceration on the proximal lateral region of the residual limb at the head of the fibula, as well as in the distal medial regions. Alignment within the prosthesis being inset also presents a problem. This results in limb pressure that is proximal medial and distal lateral, and also a compensation type gait being a broad based gait so that patients may widen their stance to make up for the more inset prosthesis. This also results in ulceration uh, along the proximal medial and distal lateral portions of the residual limb. Below the knee prosthesis gait abnormalities include the foot being too forward which results in knee extension or patella base pain, or the foot being too posterior, which can result in knee flexion abnormalities. <clears throat> and we can appreciate this with the image on the right. So a question on this topic. The clinical photograph is from a patient who has developed a residual limb ulcer following a traumatic transtibial amputation two years ago. What is the preferred treatment to resolve the ulcer? Number one. Avoid wearing the prosthesis until the ulcer is healed and perform local wound care. Obtain new prosthe prosthesis with an energy storing foot to dampen impact. Perform local wound care in conjunction 
with modification of the prosthetic socket and cushion liner, excise the wound and advance the soft tissue envelope, or perform a distal tibiofibular bone bridge and advance the soft tissue envelope. The appropriate answer is to perform local wound care in conjunction with modification of the prosthetic socket and cushion lining. This abnormality is likely secondary to abnormal wear from the prosthesis, and often a modification is the best manner in which to manage these patients. So a little bit on additional lower extremity amputations. Transmetatarsal, Liz Frank, and Chopard amputations are often commonly done, and most often due to trauma or a vascular, or a vascular disease. For Liz Frank amputations, you want to preserve the muscles, including the perineus brevis and tertius, which attach to the fifth metatarsal base. These help prevent deformity. For show party amputations through the calcaneal cuboid or talonavicular joints, all the dorsal flexors, inverters, and everters of the foot are lost. And therefore, equinus and equinovarus uh, <coughs> deformities are common. And therefore, a percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening or extended Achilles tendon lengthening are often used to help prevent deformity. Individuals who collapse into late varus can actually be treated with a tibialis anterior tendon transfer, split or complete, to the neck of the talus. So as a recap and review of a couple of pearls surrounding amputations and prosthesis, prostheses, and we'll start with the upper extremity. For brachial plexus palsy, the preferred amputation, again, is the transradial or elbow disarticulation. For a shoulder fusion, it is important to recognize that the pectoralis major is used to restore elbow function. With transradial amputations, sedentary work is possible with a myoelectric prosthesis, recognizing that these are sometimes pretty heavy. And also heavy labor, heavy laborers benefit better from a body-driven prosthetic. And you lock or unlock these elbow, the un elbow joint of these prostheses with a glenohumeral extension abduction and shoulder depression motion. A few pearls on lower extremity. Single axes, the single axis hinge joints are simple and good for kids. Polycentric are very stable and also very good for flexion. Understanding the control type is also important. And a good way, and we'll talk about a good way to remember this for the exam. For a control type, the stance control or safety knee is very good for the elderly. And this makes sense, as those individuals are sometimes unstable, and therefore a stance controlled safety knee is best for an elderly patient. A swing controller, constant one speed or a variable friction can be good for different populations. The constant phase, again, makes sense for kids, the elderly or low demand patients. This, these are very simple. Variable, consisting of hydraulic, pneumatic, or computer-based prosthetics, are often best for the young, fast-paced, or very active amputee patient. As we discuss these in more detail, variable prosthe <coughs> prostheses are nice, but they are heavy and less durable, often requiring updates and repairs due to the activity and use. Articulated dynamic prostheses work well on uneven surfaces, which would be someone who is more active or a laborer, etc. A dynamic response prosthesis is also good for uneven surfaces and provides a decreased shear component. The keel, which is a spring-like posterior component, is very helpful on uneven surfaces, and a split keel is best for uneven surfaces as you have a spring-like component with a medial and lateral position on, uh, for that prosthetic side. And the prosthesis that is best for a knee disarticulation is the four-bar polycentric, which is sometimes questioned. A little bit on orthotics. Crutches uh, represent an energy requirement increase of 32%. Paraplegics have an energy expenditure increase of about 42%, particularly with the swing phase through gait. And paraplegics often <coughs> have problems with carpal tunnel or rotator cuff, uh, injuries secondary to crutch use. So a little bit on traumatic brain injury and stroke. Most of these injuries, 50% occur as a result of motor vehicle accidents. 21% secondary to falls, 
and 12% due to gunshots. Alcohol is associated in 60% of these cases. Stroke uh, being ischemic in nature or hemorrhagic being 20%. Hemiparesis is common in stroke and most of these individuals have a major impairment. Maximum improvement is expected at 12 weeks with inpatient rehab. And an important indicator and predictor of function is balance. When discussing spinal cord injury, it is important to understand whether uh, a person has a cervical, thoracic, or lumbar uh, injury, what this injury may cause in regards to their functional deficits. With a cervical spinal cord injury that is above C4, these individuals are often respiratory dependent. For an injury at the level of C4, they can often use an electric wheelchair with head or chin control. With C5, they can use an electric wheelchair with hand controls, but they have no wrist extension. C6 is a critical level to remember and often examine, as these individuals can feed themselves and also have wrist extension contributing to that functional status. With C7 level injuries, they have manual wheelchair uh, management. For thoracic injuries, uh, they are often wheelchair dependent uh, and also can prov provide independent transfers. For lumbar, it's a variable bowel and bladder control, as well as variable lower extremity function. And for sacral injuries, bowel and bladder dysfunction are the most common abnormalities, uh, deformities that we have to manage going forward. This diagram outlines again by level the functional deficits associated with a spinal cord injury and is here for your reference uh, in preparation for the exam. A brief discussion on polio, which <clears throat> we are often seeing now and it is often tested on the board exams. Polio leads to a loss of muscle, uh, of the muscle unit function over time with nerve cell inactivation. This is a disease of the anterior horn cells affected by the polio virus. Findings include a drop off of muscle unit function and, sens and sensation is often normal. The best treatment is daily exercise, and this is very important, at sub-exhaustion levels. As repetitive exercise or therapy above uh, exhaustion actually leads to a progression and decreased function associated with this uh, disease and with the virus. Surgeries include contra uh, contraction release, tendon transfers, or sometimes orthodesis to get the best outcome. So a few questions. While experts disagree whether the post-polio virus is caused by a reactivation of the dormant virus or by an, <clears throat> an attritional aging phenomenon of muscles that have been overworked over a period of time, both groups recommend which of the following guidelines for optimizing function in this population. Refrain from exercise, exercise muscles to exhaustion, but, below, but allow one day in between exercise sessions to allow the muscles to recover. Exercise muscles to exhaustion, but allow two days in between exercise sessions to allow the muscles to recover. Exercise daily at sub-exhaustion levels, or exercise should be limited to postural and anti-gravity muscles. So based on what we just discussed, the key is to exercise at a sub-exhaustion level, and therefore the appropriate answer to this question would be response number four. Exercise programs of musculoskeletal rehabilitation should focus on which of the following? Muscle agonist strength only, <clears throat> non-painful range of motion, repetitive flexion-based low back exercises, muscle balance and endurance, long-term passive modalities. So understand that motion is an energy efficient process that should be non-painful. The appropriate answer would be response number two. <clears throat> Additional questions. Work hardening can be a step in returning an injured worker to his or her pre-morbid level of function. It consists of home fitness program for ongoing conditioning, speed, agility, quickness, and dynamic conditioning, independent medical evaluation, return to work weight restrictions, or replication of work activities in the controlled environment. Appropriate answer here being replication of work activities in the controlled environment gives you the best replication of their activity level. For the active young patient with a transfemoral amputation, what is the best choice of knee component in an above the knee amputation prosthesis? Manual locking knee, <clears throat> a computer leg, 
a single axis knee, a constant friction, or a four bar linkage polycentric prosthetic. The computer leg, as we spoke about earlier, one thing to remember about the computer leg when it's appropriate, it's often for the young population. They're active. And the way I remember this is that young patients often are very good with computers, therefore they get a computer leg. What is the optimal level for a transtibial amputation? <clears throat> 4.5 centimeters of bone length per 30 centimeters of body height, 5 centimeters to 7 centimeters from the medial tibial plateau, 12.5 to 17 and a half centimeters from the medial plateau, 18 to 25 centimeters from the medial plateau, or 25% of the intact tibia length from medial plateau to medial malleolus. And as we discussed previously, you want to preserve 12 centimeters of bone at least, and therefore the appropriate response here is 12 and a half to 17 and a half centimeters from the medial plateau. Knee hyperextension during stance phase of gait may occur as a result of spasticity of the ankle plantar flexors or knee extensors, be lessened by adding a Morton's extension to the patient's shoe, allow normal forward advancement of the tibia and the stance phase, facilitate contralateral limb advancement, or be corrected by botulinum toxin injection to the ankle dorsiflexors. So understanding the importance of knee hyperextension during the stance phase, then the appropriate answer is this occurs as a result of spasticity of the ankle plantar flexors or knee extensors uh, is the appropriate response. A patient suffered a stroke three months ago and now has a painful swollen and warm lower extremity. A three-phase bone scan and serum alkaline phosphatase will confirm what diagnosis in most cases. This is an important concept to understand, and this is trying to make a connection between traumatic brain injury uh, and the <coughs> two main answers that you think about would be thinking of heterotopic bone ossification for a long bone injury or even complex regional pain syndrome. In this case, the appropriate response is heterotopic ossification uh, secondary to the traumatic brain injury, which is commonly seen uh, in the orthopedic realm post-trauma. The tibialis anterior muscle has maximum electrical activity during which phase of the gait cycle? Is it number one, toe off or early? Toe off late? Initial contact? Foot flat or mid stance? As you go back to the slides earlier in the talk, we discussed the eccentric and concentric aspects of muscle function of the tibialis anterior. And this is how we're looking for the maximum electrical activity that occurs during that uh, for the tibialis anterior with the appropriate response being initial contact. And that is when it is functioning uh, with uh, heel contact and helping manage controlling the uh, gradual lowering of the forefoot into the foot flat position. A few more questions as we uh, work toward the end. So for maximal prosthetic control after distal transfemoral amputation, and myodesis, an important step to achieve a residual limb that is maintained in slight flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, or internal rotation. So this question is speaking to the importance of the myodesis as we discussed previously uh, and the role that it plays in limiting abduction and by counteracting this with maintaining adduction. Which of the following procedures will prevent the most common complication associated with a chosoir amputation? An Achilles tendon tenotomy, a transfer of the plantar flexors to the talus, preservation of the metatarsal basis, release of the lateral ankle ligaments, or release of the deltoid ligament. An amputation through the chosoir joints often leads to a equinus or equinovarus deformity, and therefore the Achilles tendon tenotomy or tendon lengthening is the most commonly used uh, associated procedure to help minimize this complication. And what is the most important factor when prescribing the components for a lower limb prosthesis in an adult? Gender, age at the time of amputation, current and potential functional levels, current age of the patient, socioeconomic status. Understanding as many of the prostheses we discussed, we spoke about them in relation to a number of these uh, factors but the most important is their current and potential functional level 
which can be affected by age uh, and also uh, by a functional level and activity and type of amputation uh, or morbidity that led to the amputation. Which of the following techniques most efficiently strengthen skeletal muscle? And this goes back to one of the most important concepts we discussed at the very beginning of this talk. Is it isotonic, isometric, pyometric, eccentric, or concentric? And this goes to our point of the eccentric contraction being the most efficient and also representing an elongation of muscle action. And this is a very simple, straightforward question that is often asked to uh, support this concept. A 67-year-old patient has left-sided spastic equinal varus of the ankle secondary to stroke four years ago. There is 100, uh, passive, 100 degrees of passive plantar flexion and an inability to correct the heel to neutral. Muscle strength is greater than four, sensation is normal. Ankle, an ankle foot orthosis is not tolerated. And so the next most appropriate step is to, now this is the individual who has a sp spastic equinal varus and they are asking if we should perform a flexor digitorum longus transfer to the navicular, a common extensor tendon transfer to the midfoot, perineus longus length, uh, tendon lengthening, a split anterior tibial transfer, and gastroc recession, or ankle arthrodesis. So speaking to the spastic equinal varus uh, from the prior amputation, we should be leaning towards some level of a lengthening procedure, uh, and therefore also potentially an equinal varus associated with uh, plantar flexion and therefore the appropriate response is the split anterior tibial tendon transfer and gastroc recession. A 22-year-old transtibial amputee is an avid runner but has difficulty running on uneven ground. What prosthetic mo foot modification would most likely address this problem? Now this question speaks to some of our discussions surrounding the appropriate type of dynamic foot prostheses or below the knee amputation prosthesis. One, the stationary ankle flexion, uh, excuse me, flexible endoskeleton an articulated dynamic response prosthesis, a solid ankle cushioned heel or a sac foot, a solid ankle split heel or an energy storing prosthesis. Understand this individual is 22, a transtibial amputation or BKA, and also an avid runner, but also wants to run on uneven ground. Our appropriate response would be an articulated dynamic response prosthesis. The articulated nature will allow him to appropriately manage uneven surfaces the dynamic response will also be helpful during uh, running, and as he is young, he will be able to manage his prosthesis quite well with the appropriate training. And then, a 66-year-old female <coughs> patient with type 1 diabetes has a deep non-healing ulcer under the first metatarsal head and a necrotic tip of the great toe. He has been under the direction of wound care clinics for four months and has had uh, orthotics and shoe wear changes. What objective findings are indicative of this patient's ability to heal the wound postoperatively? Absolute toe pressures of 55 millimeters of mercury, uh, transcutaneous oxygen levels of 20 millimeters of mercury, arterial brachial indices or ABIs of 1.2 at the level of surgery, an ABI of 0 0.3 at the level of surgery, or an albumin level of 2.5. This question speaks to the importance of the appropriate indicators for successful healing following amputation. And in this particular case, the, the one indicative uh, value here of the choices for good healing would be the absolute toe pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury, understanding that we would like toe pressures a minimum greater than 40. So a few rehab top facts, and then we, and then we will close. Again, eccentric muscle lengthening and elongation are, are critical, and this is the most energy efficient process. Concentric muscle shortening is contraction, Isocentric is length constant, and isotonic represents a muscle tension constant with shortening to move the joint. We want to also revisit our abnormal gait and muscle causes slide. Uh, this is a good review for you to have in preparation for the exam as well. Understand that the eccentric muscle action is the most appropriate action uh, and most efficient. Amputation planning, again, the variables that are most important, serum albumin of greater than 3.5, absolute lymphocyte count of greater than 1,500, uh, hemoglobin of greater than 10, and ischemic index of greater than or equal to 0 0.5, and a Doppler ultrasound with arterial pressures of 70 millimeters of mercury, and the gold standard of TCPO2s being greater than 40 uh, for good healing. Amputation energy expenditure is important to understand. The more proximal you go, the more energy and oxygen you consume, and vascular amputations consume most energy in majority of cases. 
The transmetatarsal is frank and show part amputations are associated with a number of abnormalities or deformities following them. This slide uh, reminds us of the importance of preserving muscles for Liz Frank attachments, I mean, for Liz Frank amputations. For the show part joints, all dorsiflexions and inverters are lost, so often we need an Achilles tendon lengthening or recession to minimize the equinus or equinal varus deformity. And for those with late varus, a tibialis anterior tendon transfer to the talus can be helpful for this deformity. Polio, again, a rehash of what we discussed previously, very common, addresses the anterior horn cells. This is a result of a drop-off of muscle unit function, and we need to exercise them at sub-exhaustion levels. And thanks and good luck to the group uh, on your recertification exam.